Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here this morning. Pleasure to be here as always. We're going to be continuing our study in the book of Revelation. There's a fairly good chance we're finishing chapter 13 this morning. I know. It seems like just yesterday we started verse 1. <laughs> so I invite you to follow along in your Bibles and open to Revelation chapter 13. And we'll begin in verse 11. And as you're finding your way there, let's open in prayer. Lord in heaven, I do thank you for another day that you've given us here. I thank you for the opportunity to get together and share your word, to study it, and get to know you as a person. God, that is one of the greatest joys this side of heaven, that while we were yet enemies and sinners against you, you gave us Jesus Christ, you died for our sins and was buried and rose again that third day and brought us close to you. I'm so thankful for that, for restoring the relationship that we broke. Thank you, Lord, for paying for that all those years ago and giving us the joy today that we can celebrate life today right here and now, uh, knowing that one day we'll have a body like unto Jesus' body and be able to live with you forever in paradise. And I pray as always that you guide us by your Holy Spirit to understand the words we're reading in the book of Revelation specifically, but always that it brings understanding of the times and a boldness to share the gospel of your grace now, today, uh, to make the most of the, every one of our days for your glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Revelation 13. I'll read from verse 11 through to the end and try and recap briefly what we've been over for the last several weeks. Revelation 13, 11, John writes, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Where to begin, huh? We've seen a couple of beasts made known in this chapter. In verse 1, it is the capital A Antichrist, the son of perdition. That beast comes onto the scene with a vengeance. Uh, this is both the individual and his kingdom that are coming to fruition. If you remember, we went back to Daniel chapter 7, which essentially talks about the same kind of event. Uh, also, given the context of the three beasts that came before that, which happened to be the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and then this great, terrible, dreadful beast that Daniel saw. Here in Revelation 13, we have the whole amalgamation of beasts in verse 2, and that's both his kingdom, gives you the idea of the kingdom, having this one global government. Uh, from all the language that we read in Daniel chapter 7, how all the world will, will worship this beast and worship it here. And uh, the first few verses, we see that one of the heads of the beast the seven heads is wounded as a word to death, but apparently comes back to life so that the world wonders at the, after this beast, who can make war with him? Uh, he appears to be a superhuman power. And so the world will wor uh, worship after, wonder after the beast and worship him. I'm confusing both of those terms there in verses 3 and 4. And this guy is going to speak great blasphemies against God, against heaven, against the saints, against uh, his... his 
angelic host. And he's going to have the ability to make war with the saints and overcome them. And we can only imagine the atrocities that are going to take place here. He's going to persecute Jews in particular, uh, but those that sincerely believe, those that say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right, he's going to be going after them because they're not worshiping him. And he's going to persecute them with unprecedented zeal that many will lose their lives. We went back to Revelation 6 for that fifth seal, just to remind us that there were many souls under the altar, that those were slain for the testimony which they held, and they're asking, how long, Lord, holy and true? Right, and he says at that point, just rest a little while until, um, how does he say that? The rest of your brethren... I'm not in the right chapter. That's why that looked foreign. Uh, <laughs> they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So they're going to give their lives as a witness to the truth. Some may turn and trust in Christ. Some may not. Probably the bulk of them will not, given uh, all the language we read in the Bible, right? Straight and narrow is that gate that leads unto eternal life, like Jesus said in his earthly ministry and broad and wide is the gate that leads unto destruction. So many are going to choose that, unfortunately. Many are going to swear their fealty or sell their soul, essentially is what this is, by taking the mark of the beast. And we're going to read in chapter 14, you take that mark, that's it, you're done, there's no coming back. And there's a lot of gravity. I don't want to just breeze over that statement. Right? God says it, not me. You can glance at it in uh, Revelation 14 in verses 9 and 10, if you'd like to read it, 9, 10, and 11. So it really is coming. And I, I've struggled with bringing that right analogy. I always try to come up with the most powerful one, and I just fail to do, do so every time. You know, the rubber hits the road, the hammer falls, the line in, in the sand is drawn. Uh, it's all there, right? It, this is it. And, and God is going to pour out his wrath. And what we're going to read about, little teaser if I don't get there this morning, the everlasting gospel is going to get preached. So you can think about what that is, but God says what it is. So we'll get there soon enough. The second beast that comes out comes out of the earth. John witnesses that, Revelation 13, 11. This beast is like a lamb with two horns, but spake as a, spoke as a dragon. There's the old English coming out of me. Speaks as a dragon. So we know that this is a false prophet. It actually says that in Revelation 16. He's called the false prophet. It is a man, but we're getting the spiritual reality behind this man. Okay, just like the son of perdition is really a man, but we get the reality behind that. Here's this great, terrible, dreadful beast, and he's going to have this one world government power behind him, trillions of dollars at his disposal, all the wealth of the world at his disposal, and he's got the worship of the bulk of the world too. I mean, who can take on this beast, right? Uh, it's It's going to be a very scary time, but we know from Revelation 12 that the remnant will be protected. They will take a stand against him, and they'll be okay somehow. Right? And somehow that's going to work out. We don't have all the details of that, but we know that they will be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. They'll be taken care of for three and a half years. So this second beast, the false prophet, looks like a lamb, meek, mild, submissive. People will think, well, he's really nice something like that, but he's got all the power of the first beast, and he's going to cause the, uh, let's see, verse 12, cause them that dwell on the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, and he's going to do all these wonders. Okay, we don't know all of them, but one called out in verse 13 is he's going to make fire come down from heaven in the sight of men, probably to consume those that don't believe. Right, he's, just like Elijah did back in 2 Kings, remember we talked about that, the captains in their 50s met their demise there. Uh, but also the two witnesses, whoever spoke against the two witnesses, they would have fire come out of their mouths and consume their enemies. And so in like manner, because Satan does his mimicry, he's never got the full power of God, but he mimics and gets close. He's going to have this false prophet doing miracles in the sight of men that are going to deceive them. And so again, we brought up the strong delusion that God speaks about in 2 Thessalonians. For this cause I will send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Um, 
however that finishes, <laughs> because they rejected the love of the truth, something like that. So my memory is not perfect, but it's definitely written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So all of that is going on here. And uh, verse 14, I had to point out that he has these miracles which he had power to do. The Greek there is poema, to create or to cause these miracles to happen. Uh, it's not authoritative, exousia. It's not ability, dunamis. There's a whole bunch of powers in the Greek. <laughs> kind of get that idea still in the English, but that's what's going on there. And then he causes them to make this image. So last time we had talked about how different this image was. We went back to Daniel chapter 3 when Nebuchadnezzar, the crazy king, decided to make this image. And uh, the similarities between Revelation 13 and Daniel 3 couldn't be ignored. Uh, all that would not worship that beast he wanted killed. Uh, he wanted killed in a fire burned seven times as hot or a furnace burning seven times as hot as normal. And uh, we looked also that this image was 60 cubits tall, six, six cubits broad, and whenever six instruments were played, then you need to worship this image. So you do have the concept of 666 six, six there, and people try to make arguments of the correlation, this is the mark, and that sort of thing. We'll talk about the mark yet in just a moment. But that's the image that Nebuchadnezzar made, and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, of course, stood up to that and said, no way, we're not going to do that. We worship the one true God who can deliver us from you, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your image. All right, so it's this hard and fast stand. And boy, is that a challenge to us today, isn't it? When we get challenged for our faith, uh, it could be practically anything. I just tried to think of a few off the top of my head, and I think back to uh, show me the proof that there is a God, um, which there, you know, it's everywhere. And I've learned over the time to ask, well, what proof will you accept? Instead of trying to point out all the different proofs that do exist. So there's that uh, from the creation of the world, the inv invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. So there's challenges based on science, right? Doesn't science disprove the Bible? No. <laughs> the Bible allows us to understand science. It's, it's the other way around. But people try in their flesh to suppress the truth, just like it says in Romans 1. Okay? Holding the truth in unrighteousness uh, is what I think of Man, I just want to, I'm a little tired today too. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been the uh, storm and near flooding, but we didn't have any flooding up where we were. Uh, where are we? Romans 1, the invisible things. Okay. I'll just start reading in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. There it is. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Some translations will say suppress the truth. But that's the concept there. They're taking that truth and throwing it in the proverbial circular file. Right? I don't want your truth. I've got my truth and I'm sticking to that. Doesn't that sound familiar with today's society? But that's what it is. And three times in the remainder here of Romans chapter 1, it says God gave them over. God gave them over. This is what you want. This is what you get. Right? They have the free will choice, and they're getting what they want. Well, fast forward to Revelation 13. Ultimately, this is what they want. You want to be your own gods? You want to have your own religion? Here you go. And it's going to end in death. Sad as that is. We had to compare, though, to the Standard, that's what I guess I was going to say, image or idol, uh, normal idol. So we read through Psalm 115, which covered all the bases. They have mouths, don't speak, ears, but don't hear, eyes, but don't see, hands, that don't handle, and so on. Uh, and they that make them are like unto them. This is what God's witness is against idolaters. But this image in Revelation 13 is di different because this false prophet, verse 15, says he has the power to give life unto the image that it should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image should be killed. And again, we don't have the how, but this image is somehow going to cause them to die that don't worship it. So a lot is at stake here. You can imagine in the flesh trying to save our own hide, right? Thinking futuristically in the unbeliever uh, mindset is, I don't want to die, I'm going to take that mark. Or, uh, I'm not going to be able to buy or sell, I'm going to take that mark. And apparently, as I was reading through some commentaries this last week, that a couple of different popes 
tried to pass some similar things. This was years ago, and I, well, obviously many years ago. But I didn't look too much into it. I just kind of kept it in the back of my mind that they, you cannot buy or sell with one who is a heretic. They actually passed things like this. Okay, and, and so here we are on the global scale. Like I wasn't around, so I don't know about the papacy doing such things. And I'd have to look into it. And honestly, it was just a very high level glance like, oh, really, that happened, kind of a thing. But go ahead and search that out. But this is going to be a global thing that the false prophet is going to decree. If you don't do this, then you're going to die, basically. So choose death or choose false life because it's going to end in death anyway. So verse 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Before I get into the actual number again, I want to remind us that we had sort of, I mean sort of, a glimpse of this during the COVID time, where there were people that were called the mask police, or something like that, if you recall. If anyone had dare assemble outside of their homes, in groups more than 10, I think was the limit. I refrain from jokes for now. <laughs> then they could be reported, and I don't even know what the repercussions were. Jail time, maybe? Uh, fines? I think it was a fine. You'd be confined with everybody else, not with masks, in a confined area greater than. Well, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> It, 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 we thought it odd at that point, but it, there's going to be mark police during the tribulation period. Oh, they don't have a mark. You know, go get them or, or whatever it's going to be. And I'm reminded before, again, we get to the actual name and the number and all of that. Uh, if you turn with me to Matthew 24, I guess we'll do that one first, and Luke 21. At the same time. We'll do Matthew 24 first in verse 11. Matthew 24 and verse 11. Just a reminder of what Jesus said is going to be taking place during the entire tribulation period. But it does say here that many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. There's going to be more than one, but that false prophet is like the pinnacle of them. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And if you skip down to verse 23, he says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs, plural, and false prophets, plural, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. All right, so this is strong delusion, like God alludes to 2 Thessalonians 2, and uh, what we've been reading in Revelation. Now if you go to Luke 21, I think this is the passage I was thinking of, Luke 21 and verse 20. No, that was, really wasn't the one I was thinking of either. But we'll read it anyway. Oh, well, if we back up to verse 10. There we go. Okay, so Luke 21, verse 10. It says, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And that's the reason for this persecution here. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Okay, so again, it's for a witness, for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom with all your adversaries, or which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed, and here's what I was getting at, you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks 
and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Okay, so that's the kind of, before I go on, that's the kind of attitude that's going to prevail in the tribulation period. People that are of that way, like you read in the book of Acts, are going to be sought out, persecuted, branded, uh, uh, until they're put to death. However, in verse 18, Jesus says, But there shall not in a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Right? Uh, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So he's talking about the midpoint here. It says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and them to get, that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring." men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And we just read about that in Revelation 12. Right? Satan and his angels fought against Michael and his angels and prevailed not. Satan was cast out of heaven to the earth and then the woe, woe to those on the earth for the devil is cast down. He knoweth he hath but a short time. Right? So all this stuff is really coming to a head uh, in the latter half of the tribulation period. Uh, but, verse 27, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, the, in a cloud with power and great glory. So this is going to Revelation 19 at this point. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So that's the true sign they're looking for, Christ himself. He's going to appear, like he said, as the lightning shines from east to the west. It's going to be really obvious. There he is with the heavenly host bright and shiny, <laughs> coming down to get rid of the prince of darkness and all that stuff. Uh, they will know. Lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. But all of this to show the attitude during that tribulation period is going to start off relatively small, but ramp up to the point of you know, being on the look. Like that's their day to day life, I would imagine, looking for people without the mark. I might be exaggerating, but I'm not intending to. <laughs> it's going to be really nasty. All right. And then we're going to talk about. 666. Six, six. So, back in Revelation 13, 18, it says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. And again, in the Greek, that literally means cast in your pebbles, count it up, calculate it. Okay? Uh, For it is the number of a man. That term there, man, is anthropos, meaning it's a human's number or a man's number. Uh, the same kind of phrase is used in Revelation 21, if you turn with me there briefly, Revelation 21 and verse 17. This is New Jerusalem, by the way. Revelation 21, 17 says, And he measured the wall thereof in 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Okay, so this angel was doing the measuring, but it's a measurement that we humans understand. Is that, is that clear? So when it's talking about this is the number of a man, it's a man's number, we can calculate it, we know what the number is, right? It's 666, it's a number, uh, and that's what it says, it's 666. But that number has led to so much confusion and fishing for answers that I've only grazed the top of it all uh, last week, so I'll try to recap that stuff too. First of all, the number 666 appears three other times beside right here. One of them was uh, in the book of Ezra, the people that were coming back from the captivity. There were 666 in the house of a man named Adonikim. And there was really no correlation I could see, although it's interesting to note that Adonikim, however you say that, it has the meaning, the Lord of enemies. So I don't know if that really says something about that guy or what his history may have been to acquire that name. 
we could speculate on that. But that's one place where you see 666. The only other two places say the same thing. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13. And it's the amount of gold that Solomon acquired in a year. Beside all that acquired through trade. All right, so this was just the influx of gold into Solomon. I don't see a connection whatsoever. Some people try to make the connection of wealth, worldly riches, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, but what I read in Revelation chapter 13 is, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding calculate this number. It's a number we know, it's 666. So I'm convinced that we will know for sure, not we, actually, tribulation saints are going to know for sure what that means, and they'll know for sure what it is and be able to easily choose not to take it. It's, there's so much speculation out there, and I don't, I'm not convinced of any of them. Hey, I may have said that last time. If not, I'm saying it this morning. But here are a whole bunch of other things that you'll read in commentaries. The number of six is the number of a man. Man was created on day six. You can look at that, Genesis chapter one. And more details of, being, of the creation of man is chapter two. Uh, Adam was created first, then Eve, and so forth. But it's on day six not day seven. Seven is a number of completion. Okay, we'll give you that. Some will point out that Goliath, seriously, Goliath was six cubits high. He had a spearhead weighing 600 shekels and he wore six pieces of armor. So you got 600, six, and six. The armor includes his spear, by the way. Okay, and that's in 1 Samuel 17, if you want to read about that. Someone points out that the sum of all the numbers that make the square of six is 666. Isn't that a fun mathematical game? <laughs> 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 36 does in fact add to 666. What relevance does that have? It's a number of man. It's a number of man. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see the connection there, but interesting. Noah was 600 when the flood came. There's no 60 or 6 there, but okay, he was 600 years old. Genesis chapter 46 and verse 26 says, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. Do you see a connection? Because I don't. <laughs> 600,000 men for war in Israel coming out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. Okay. Six cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35 verse 13. This, I enjoyed this one. Boaz measured six measures of barley for Ruth. See how people are really fishing for what does 666 mean? I don't see any connection there at all. Uh, but these teachings, some or not all of them, but some of those are just parroted without being thought about, without being researched, like, oh, this is what it is, this is what I heard. I don't see the relevance at all. Uh, a bit like the forest of the trees, the yeah. of a man, and then you have all these examples that are numbers represented of a relationship to some man experience the city, you know, um, Moses' life, you know, you go through all those. Those are all man, forest through the trees, you know, this number in relationship to different men. Yeah, yeah. Like, within their context, there's that relationship. But, yeah, it was, how does the phrase go? You can't see the forest for the trees, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah it just, I wanted to point out the things you will read in commentaries. If you'd happen to look at commentaries on this verse, there's a bazillion, right, the technical term. <coughs> there might be 666 commentaries on this verse, which would be very interesting. So as that angel performs that measure in the number of a man, is that an imperial or metric? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, what cubit do we... There's not even one standard cubit. It's like people make things so confusing. Is it the, the regular cubit, the royal cubit, or the one in between? I think there's three or four different cubits. I forget. But uh, like the Answers in Genesis chose to go with the largest cubit measurement to make their ark in Kentucky. The ark encounter, if you've ever been there, it's like 21.4 inches. <sighs> people make things way more complicated than they have to be. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You, know, you sort of make it very simple, saying, okay, what difference does it make? <laughs> yeah. You know, what's the relevance? What is the relevance? I, I 
Don't know, but I know that they will. Well, I got. I didn't get to the the juicy one yet. Uh, but what's interesting? What's very interesting? Before I bring that up. Well, no, I should do the reverse of that. Okay, let me tell you about six 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 again. The Greek letters for this are chi, xi, and stigma. That's an obsolete Greek letter at this time. But chi would be six hundred, xi would be sixty, and stigma was six. So that's what you'll read in the. Um, Textus Receptus, if you receive text of that verse, and it, so it does read 660 and 6. Is that a sorority? <laughs> Probably is a sorority somewhere in the world. <clears throat> so some have decided that this means the name of the man when adding the numeric values of the letters together will equal 666. Okay, so you got this, uh, what is the term? Geometria, it's like a play on geometry, that term. But uh, the letters in both Hebrew and Greek would represent numbers as well. And so people have taken that and ran with it. Hey, if you've heard of Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, I think is his title that you might know him by, calculated that the name Latinas is 666, a word that means the Latins, or we would know them as the Romans. But then some would argue, no, you can't use the Greek, you've got to use the Hebrew. So he found out that in the Hebrew term, uh, Romait, Rome, Romans, in Hebrew, also adds to 666. That's the Hebrew equivalent for Romans or Latins. So they were very convinced uh, that this is the Roman Empire. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard that in Revelation, this is the revived Roman Empire to take over the world? see a lot of nodding heads. Yeah, I've heard a lot about that too, but when we read through the accounts in the book of Daniel, uh, it's not Rome. It's something different. Right? It's something more powerful than Rome was. And yeah, again, he's, he's looking for that term. People have used this anal um, technique today to say Prince Charles of Wales adds to 666 as well. So there's that out there. I don't I don't buy it, <laughs> because now it's King Charles, and like, oh, that doesn't work. Well, so there's people that are fishing for these things and trying to find it this side of the tribulation period, and I don't think it's going to be known until then, personally. Uh, so there's that out there. People have also come up with Nero Caesar. That adds to 666, but obviously he was not the son of perdition. Uh, to me, it's a lot like the 88 reasons the world's going to end in 1988. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all of these things are just people trying to come up with stuff on their own and force a definition that's just not there. Right? We, are, we should be vigilant on the lookout and keeping an eye on the tabs of the world and seeing where the, the, the state of the world is. It's in a really dark place. Uh, I keep hearing more and more of churches that are well-grounded, not even just individuals anymore, but churches that were well-grounded on sound doctrine are just falling away from that. Okay, they're dispersing. There's very few that I know of willing to even take a pulpit position, whether they be a full-time pastor or a stand-in elder or whatever you want to call it, but it's being less and less seemingly every day. So that's the state of the world that I've observed. I'm not sure if you've seen anything similar. It just seems like the world keeps going down that proverbial toilet. With all of that said, I did want to make one point before we jump into, before I let you cathart, catharsis, have a catharsis. It's a Greek term. Those that a language study would enjoy it. My, my freshman teacher, English teacher in high school, loved that word, so I became very familiar with it. Uh, but it, it, it's to let out your emotions, let out your thoughts, just vent, okay? I want to give you that chance, but if you turn with me first to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I've got to point this out which is still done today by some in Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt 
Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And note this. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So a lot in Israel take this quite literally, and they use this thing called the telephine, te tephilim, which is an actual bit of the Torah written in a little box, and it's wrapped around and placed on their hand, and I'm actually showing the left hand because the amount of times they wrap it around is also important. It's, it's very legalistic. And it's on their hand, and they actually will put it a headband on them with that box and bits of Torah written in, there on, in that box and put it on their foreheads. Okay, so they'll walk around with these things. So it's interesting that God would say that, and we could joke, I guess, and get facetious about all of that. But Satan's mimicking it. <laughs> He's having them literally bind a mark to their hand or to their forehead. Now, in this context, God is saying, live this thing out every moment of your life. That's essentially what he's getting at. Uh, not saying that you're going to trust in this handy little box. Okay, it's his word that he wants them to live out every day to consume it every day, to, to live it out. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. It's on their hand, on their forehead. And I've only got like maybe two other comments to say. So with all of that said, any thoughts, comments you want to share anymore? Yeah. Well, you know, it's just one more thing that points to the fact that the tribulation period is meant for the Jewish people. You know, that because this is something that they will recognize if they remember the scripture. Yeah, that's a good point. Another reason that it, this is the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel will endure this. Uh, Israel's in focus. Also the evil um, trinity because they're taking something that was of God and they're twisting it to their own use. Right, yeah. We have the unholy trinity going on too in the book of Revelation. There's going to be a lot more evidence too when we get to chapter 14, the 144,000 being the first fruits. So I'll just put that out there. Uh, anyone else want to share? Okay. Yeah, if, you, if you're interested for a fun read, see what everybody says about 666. Most of the extra studious commentators that I've noted state a whole bunch of things, but they all, all come back to the same conclusion that those of the tribulation period, they'll know. And essentially, they come back to that point. Is that kind of like under the framework of those who went through COVID, it'll be obvious because it'll be timely? Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? We went through COVID, we went through the masks and the lockdowns and all that kind of thing. So yeah. Contextual to the experience. Okay. Right, yeah. So we would understand, yeah, I couldn't use this COVID analogy to anybody, any other generation. Right? right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be obvious to them. They'll see it coming, they'll see it announced uh, from the powers that be, and they'll, they'll see the hidden agenda behind it. I did want to point out, yeah, we don't have to worry about this number in the Age of Grace. I just want to make that one clear. I know some people freak out when they go shopping and their total amounts to $6.66, or they buy something else, or they see something else that has, ends up being $666. I don't, no. <laughs> That's something totally different. It's not going in your hand or forehead, is it? Uh, so it, it'll be obvious, to your point, it'll be obvious that that's the mark. All right. Well, how about we get a taste of chapter 14? We'll read the first five verses. Revelation 14, 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him in 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four and four thousand, 
which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. There's plenty to unpack here in this passage. So I'll just say we've already been introduced to these 144,000 in chapter 7. And I will give you some homework, which I won't grade, and we're going to go over it next week anyway, of the, them being the first fruits, just to go back and search the scriptures to see that this must mean that they are sealed by God on their forehead with the name of God on, on their forehead at the beginning of the tribulation period. Otherwise, first fruits makes no sense. Uh, they were redeemed among men, verse 4. That's the Greek term anthropos, humans, mankind. Okay, so they weren't redeemed from anywhere else. They were from men. They must have been on the earth. They have these first, there are the first fruits, but you get this imagery behind it, standing on Mount Sion with the Lamb. So obviously they're standing with Christ, given the imagery from that all the way back in chapter 4. I don't remember when the Lamb came into view, if that was chapter 4 or 5 all of a sudden. It was 5, okay. The Lamb has prevailed to open the seals, okay. So that goes back to, to chapter 5. They are without be fault before the throne of God, they will be able to stand. And I thought immediately back to Revelation 6 and verse 17 when those that are of the earth ask the question that the wrath of the day is come, or the great day of his wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? These guys, right? The 144,000 will be able to stand throughout the entirety of the tribulation period. So that's a little taste. We've got a lot more to look forward to on this passage next week. But again, I'll leave you the last few, one minute. If you have any other thoughts or comments you want to share before closing this morning. All right, well then let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to get to know you better, to get to know your plan better for the entire world, that all your works are just and right. That is scary and a sad time of this, this tribulation period is. Uh, we know that there are those that will make it through, those that will endure to the end, those that shall be saved. And we look forward to the, the salvation of Israel at the end of that, thinking of how great it is right now that salvation is coming to the Gentiles, as you say in your holy word in the book of Romans, and how much more will it be, how much greater will it be in the time of Israel's fullness. So we look forward to that day of restoration, look forward to the day you make all things new, uh, you come and rule on this earth and, and set things right. Um, with all this in mind and the, the tragedies that are yet to come, I, I always pray when we look at the book of Revelation that you ins inspire us to live uh, each day for you, that we make the most of each day, that we walk circumspectly, that we seize every opportunity and live the gospel, share the gospel, like we read in Deuteronomy to to have these words at the ready when we're getting up, lying down, going in, going out. Just always be ready with the gospel, the grace of God. Have those shoes of the gospel uh, fitted on our feet, uh, complete with the rest of the full armor. So may you be glorified always in everything we say and do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.